All right, let's get going. So like I said, welcome to the Uplink. Um, thank you everyone for joining. We see, like I said, a lot of people from all over the world today. I'm here with, um, well, actually I'm Jacob Swin. I'm the product marketing manager at Helium. Let me say that first. And I'm here with Larry Ketcherson from Media Sorcery to talk about um, how Media Sorcery is using Helium to tackle climate change from a variety of different ways, including regenerative agriculture, vegetation management, clean energy, and supply chain transparency. So really excited to hear Larry talk about this. Um, Larry, thanks for being on today. Appreciate it. And we'll get going. I'm going to do a um, quick little Helium intro here in case people haven't heard of Helium. I mean, you're on a Helium uplink, so I'm sure you've heard of us, but in case you want a little more info, Helium was founded in 2013 by Amir Halim and Sean Fanning. Um, with the mission to make it easier to build decentralized wireless networks. And we've built the world's largest decentralized wireless network, and it's still growing. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But to get here, we're, we've been backed by some of the best VC firms in the world, and we're very thankful for them and their help. You can see listed here some of those VC firms, Costla Ventures, First Mark, GV, formerly Google Ventures, Mark Benioff, Multicoin. Um, the list goes on, but we're very thankful to them for all their help in getting us to where we're at today. Like I said, the network growth. Um, I just updated these numbers not too long ago, so I hope they're, they're close to being accurate. I'm always a little bit off because we keep growing, but we're almost at 600,000 hotspots right now in 40, over 45,000 cities and 163 countries around the world. So it's amazing every day to check Helium Explorer and see just how much the network has grown. Um, I think the trend right now, and I, well, when I checked last, we we're about 80,000 hotspots onboarded in the last 30 days. So amazing to see, and that's a pretty consistent number. Um, the Helium network itself, some of the benefits of using Helium, some of the ways Helium kind of differentiates itself from other networks. The low, low data transfer costs are standard example, like I have here. It costs about a dollar per year for a device. It's supposed to say four, I'm missing an F there, sending data every five minutes. So um, very cheap to send data and you're only paying for usage. You're not signing a contract. You're not signing, you're not you know, getting a subscription, anything like that. When you send, when you send data, you pay for that and that's all. Um, Helium is also very accessible and easy to use. So pretty much any compatible off-the-shelf LoRaWAN device, you can get on the network and get going and get it up on console. So simple to use and easy to get started. And also Helium, because it's open source, um, there's a lot of access to various open source projects. You can avoid issues such as vendor lock-in, things like that. Um, but you know, we have a lot of different people in the community helping out and providing um, help with all these different projects and helping the network grow. So we're very thankful for them, but it also is really nice to have that option. Just a few highlights from 2021, which was a huge year, the year I started working at Helium. I don't know why we don't have that slide on there, but um, <laughs> sorry, a little, little humor from the host. Um, we had amazing growth. So we went from 14,000 to 400,000 hotspots in one year, which is amazing. I actually go back and look at the first blog I wrote, I think in April or May of last year, and we were at like 24,000 hotspots. So just from like middle of last year to the, to December, 2021, we grew all the way from like 20 some thousand to 400,000 hotspots. So amazing to see that network growth. We've had a lot of um, growth in our ecosystem as well coming with that. Um, tons of different types of use cases from asset tracking to, you know, um, air quality monitoring, all types of things. You can check that out on our Helium ecosystem page and see what types of use cases are enabled by Helium. Um, we had validators were announced, I believe, in June 2021 to help the network with stability as it grows. We also had some pretty exciting announcements from major partners. Well, we had Helium 5G, so we partnered with Dish and Freedom Fi, and that 5G is coming, and that's a really exciting thing for 2022. We also partnered with the city of San Jose in September of 2021. Well, that's one of my favorite use cases because I really love to see the way that Helium helps um, 
organizations, entities, companies, really, you can see a tangible benefit to helping people. So the city of San Jose is deploying helium compatible hotspots, using the earnings from those hotspots to help low income households with internet access. So exciting stuff there. And a lot to look forward to in 2022 as well. Like I said, helium 5G is coming. Um, 3G, a lot of actually today is AT&T shutting down their 3G network today. So a lot of uh, T-Mobile's next, I believe, July 1st. So a lot of 3G networks are sunsetting now. So if people are still using 3G for their IoT deployments, it might be a good time to check out Helium. Um, we've signed some roaming partners. We're getting more and more of those on board and light hotspots on the way. So the network's growing. The network has a lot of exciting stuff to look forward to. Some very recent news here. We've signed some new partners that we're talking with, including Media Sorcery here today, Cooler Farms, um, Extelia is uh, our latest roaming announcement as a roaming partner, and we hit 500,000 to half a million hotspots not too long ago, and we're almost at 600,000 now, but that half a million was a pretty cool number to kind of see and get out on our socials. Um, so that's my helium spiel. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Larry, and he's going to talk a little bit about what Media Sorcery does with helium. Fantastic. Thank you, Jacob. Absolutely. So as Jacob said, I'm Larry Ketcher, said I'm the CEO of Media Sorcery, and I am, I am not going to kill you with PowerPoint slides or pages slides or keynote slides or whatever kind of slides these are. Uh, I'm going to go through just a, a little bit of background on the company and then get into some show and tell, show you some of our applications, uh, show you some of our sensors. Uh, if you have questions or if there's different things that you'd like to see, please uh, uh, post that in the chat. But just a little bit of what we want to talk about. Um, I want to talk about how we got here to where we're using uh, the lower RAN network and the helium uh, network to push in events into our existing applications and why our existing applications are very appropriate for what Helium does. And I, I want to demonstrate, as Jacob talked about, some of the solutions we've got for regenerative agriculture and vegetation management. And we can talk about some of the others that we're doing, like uh, we have a recycling tracking product uh, and a cold chain track tracking product, all of which take data from different types of Helium sensors and, and put them on the record of those assets as they're moving through their, uh, their workflow and their processes. So we, we do workflow automation and process automation, and we've always done it based on uh, transparency and trust. Um, we have a patent on what's called non-repudiation, which is when you move data from point A to point B, there's enough metadata collected about the packet of data, the sender and the receiver to where you cannot repudiate, you cannot deny that that packet actually moved from point A to point B. Um, early on, we tried to get a um, patent on a, a simplified PKI system. We abandoned that patent, but that I'm just saying that because we've been following all of the blockchain technologies for a long, long time. We use public key, private key pairs and a lot of things that we do. So we decided early on that moving data from point A to point B was just one task and a workflow. And a lot of what needed to be done to workflows and all processes is, is anything that you can do to close out those tasks and move them quicker. So we have a rules engine called events, triggers, and actions because anything that's coming in that can affect a workflow is an event. And you can write a rule that's gonna trigger an action to move that task to its, its normal completion. Uh, as you'll see on the next slide, we've been in the healthcare marketplace for a long, long time. We've got to follow certain uh, HIPAA rules and, and PHI protections. And because of that and our patent, we're really deep into authentication and authorization security. And we use that to make sure you can only see things that you're supposed to see or that you can see um, anything on the network, but it all depends on what the authorization is. So just as some background on the healthcare, we've been We've been monitoring healthcare workflows like uh, patient setups, like patient orders, insurance eligibility checks, um, monitoring diabetes, blood glucose meters, and all the processes about that, monitoring blood pressure cuffs. So we, we've done a lot in the healthcare world that, that kind of builds us up to what we're doing in the helium world. And, and with our rules engine, we've monitored somewhere, I think this, I think this number is old, 
um, over 5 million events. And when I say it's an event, it could be like I've got a, a, a blood glucose meter here. This blood glucose meter um, sends an event every time somebody does a check. And that every time you do check your blood glucose level, we receive it. We look at it against a set of rules that some smart subject matter expert programmed into our system. And then we take an action if that event triggers that, that rule. Um, and I'll go over that in a little bit more detail. So we've, we've integrated a lot of different devices from a healthcare standpoint, and now we've integrated we're probably up to 20 different types of IoT sensors for some of the solutions that Jacob mentioned and that we'll, we'll get into in a little bit. So just to finish the healthcare parallel, you know, we, we look at events as we're going to monitor them and just show them to somebody. We're going to take a notification action on them, which could be a text message or an email or something. We're going to take a more automated programmatic action by launching a web service uh, to further along that task to keep the workflow moving. Or we're going to do a, a compound type of a, of a rule where you want to look at two events from two disparate sources. And if those two events match up the rule that you put in, you want, you want to take an action based on that. So for that last one, for that compound one, this is our, this is our rules engine. And this is a rule that we put together when working with one of our healthcare customers during the COVID-19 pandemic. We, we started a, um, a partnership with a company called Romware too. I don't know if you guys can see this very well. So this is a, there's several of these on the market. This is a, um, am I within six meters of you or, you know, six feet, am I within two meters of you? Um, a lot of people during the pandemic started these uh, encounter sensors. And if you got close, it'll buzz or whatever but this will also send an event. So one of our healthcare partners uh, has COVID-19 test kits that are FDA EUA approved, and we get a lot of data from whether people are positive or negative. So we can put a compound rule together that says, if, if you got a positive test, you know maybe it's a, a PCR test, maybe it's an antigen test, and one of these encounters, um, and this is a demo rule, the rules basically say, how many meters away do you want me to alert somebody? So if I get an encounter that's within six feet or two meters, and one of the people that I've encountered tested positive, I can send two different kinds of actions. I can send to the primary person, hey, you, it looks like you tested positive. You probably ought to go isolate and everything else. But to the other people, you can send another message that says you probably encountered somebody. So that, that's how the compound rules work in the, in the healthcare market. So the parallel to that, um, well, it, it, when we started doing the COVID test kits, uh, to Jacob's point about 3G, we, we started out needing to track temperature uh, as the asset was moving and then as it was at rest. And we started with a 3G sensor in a warehouse cooler, and then we started deploying them to a bunch of laboratory coolers, and it just got to be too expensive. I mean, it, as Jacob mentioned, it was a per device, per monthly fee for that temperature sensor. And we rapidly found uh, this sensor. That's a, uh, this is a Dragino low temperature sensor that's got a low temperature probe that will go down to the temperatures that you have to keep these uh, COVID test kits for. So that's, that's kind of how we got from, um, you know, just being in the healthcare marketplace to where we started taking helium sensor data and adding it into all of the workflows and into our ETA rules engine like we did. So to keep going on that parallel, so, so now we've started getting into solutions for either assets in motion, like uh, when we recycle products or assets at rest, like farms or solar arrays, when we're monitoring the different environmental factors around those two types of installations. So the regenerative agriculture one is a, is a big one for us right now that we're doing deployments in Mexico and in Oklahoma. And we have a variety of sensors that I'll show you some data on here in a second, but, but it's the same parallel as what we've been doing in the healthcare marketplace. So integrating the sensors into what we were doing before was a pretty straightforward thing to do. We, we want to monitor soil moisture so that subject matter experts can get that data and examine that data and see uh, what the correlations are, then maybe we want to text the message to the farmer or the irrigation person that soil moisture, the soil is getting pretty dry, you might want to go turn on the water. 
more more automatically, we want to automatically turn on the the irrigation system if soil moisture gets too low. But then with a compound one, we might want to look at what type of soil it is by looking at the soil pH and look at the soil moisture and look at a weather sensor and then say, well, it looks like it's going to rain. So do I really want to go waste some uh, some water on this? So if I go back to uh, the rules engine, I look at another rule. You know, we can have just a regular rule about dry soil that says um, if if the threshold is less than 30%, um, I wanna do something. I can either notify somebody with an email, I can send them uh, a text message that says, go turn on the water faucet or go turn on the irrigation. But the, the, the thing that we're trying to get everybody to do is I wanna send a web service call uh, that says, go turn on the spigot. You know, I'm, I can go put a lower ran relay on a water faucet or on the irrigation system or just a power switch. And if I detect that I want the water on, I can automatically go turn that water on. So the other thing that we're doing with this data, so this is, uh, this is all of the events that we pull from a bunch of the different sensors um, in a graphing program over the last seven days. And some of these you're gonna see go away because the sensors are now in my hands and they're not outside uh, collecting data. But, but the idea is to, to get all of the event data, uh, put it in front of somebody who understands regenerative agriculture better than we do and have them tell us, well, you know, if, if pH gets to be right here and my soil conductivity is right here, uh, and temperature and moisture are right here, then do X. Or if, if that's trending in the wrong way, you're, you may not be using the principles of regenerative agriculture. And just for background, let me explain what I know about regenerative agriculture. And, and I'm not a farmer. I ran over a lot of hay bales when I was working on my uncle's farm, but, but I, I know enough about it to be dangerous. So regenerative agriculture is a way to um, use the soil so that uh, it will keep most of the carbon sequestered within the soil. If, if you go through and till up the soil a lot, which is what a lot of farmers do these days, and then replant the same crop over and over again, the, the, when you till it up, the carbon gets released into the air. A lot of the nutrients get, get released into the air. And if you plant the same thing over and over again, those same nutrients get used up. So you end up trying to push the nutrients back by putting additives in, and, and some of the additives aren't good for carbon sequestration. So what, what regenerative agriculture farmers do now is they'll go take a, a square of soil and they'll figure out where on their farm they got that square of soil and they'll put it in a bag and they'll send it to an approved lab and the lab will test it for soil pH, soil moisture, soil NPK, which is nitrogen, potassium, and uh, phosphorus. And, and then they'll go take the soil from the same place six months later and test it again. And then they'll say, well, based on trends over that six month period, you are or you are not going in the right direction for regenerative agriculture. And what, what we're trying to do by allowing those scientists to see this in real time is giving them enough data so that they can, you know, not only do things like smart irrigation and smart water to, watering, but they can also uh, determine if the farmers are using best practices and, and using regenerative agriculture in their, in their processes. The other thing I'll point out on here, um, you know, some of these, some of these sensors, and again, I told Jacob, I've got so many sensors, I can play show and tell all day. Uh, some of them have GPS coordinates in them and some of them don't. So what, what my team has done is if you see this sensor location uh, square down here in the bottom, um, since the Helium network is a blockchain and it's transparent, you can see what um, hotspot or what miner has given you the data for, for your sensor. So I live downtown Austin. I've got a bunch of different hotspots. I think there's 43 hotspots in my square. So when I put a test sensor out, it's always going to go to a different one. So when we pull that data, we also pull which hotspot uh, gave us that data so that we can graph if the hotspot doesn't have GPS, so we can't determine exactly where it is, we can at least graph to where, you know, within the hex, like it is on the Helium Explorer, where that data come, came from. 
which which is most of the time close enough. If you're on a if you're doing a farm, if we're doing a, a solar array or we're doing a wind farm, it, you're going to be pretty uh, proximate to that location if you just use the the helium hotspot location. Uh, let me show one more graph and then I'll get back to death by slides. Uh, these, these two sensors are, I mean, they're on the solar array monitoring. So what we're doing with solar array monitoring is we have a partner company called Everpoint Services, which is uh, a boots on the ground services organization. And what they would normally do is once a week, they would dispatch somebody out to a solar array to see if vegetation had grown up, to see if there was uh, a lot of particulate matter on the solar array that was affecting the effectiveness of the solar array and just generally do a, do a clean. Um, whatever Point Services wants to do is use this kind of monitoring, uh, including this line of sight monitoring that's down here at the bottom. Um, and these missing ones down here are because I've, I've got this particular, this is, this is that sensor, sorry, I should have left it plugged in instead of brought it for show and tell. But this line of sight sensor we would put to see is, is the line of sight over the array or under the array clear of vegetation. And if it is, I probably don't need to waste time and money sending somebody out there. If it if something does get in the way and I get an alert, like you can see this thing bouncing up and down because uh, again, I've got it here with me. So this is a line of sight sensor that's just got a, a LIDAR uh, detector at the end. And it'll, you know, no matter what's in its way, it's gonna say whether it's, um, uh, if the distance has changed between where, what it was seeing and what it's not seeing. But then you can dispatch somebody out there if only if they need to go out there and clean the solar array. The, the other thing that we're doing with these solar ra radiation sensors, which are probably the, you know, if you want to geek out, they're probably the coolest sensor. They're from a Swiss company called uh, Descent Lab. I don't know if you guys can see that all right. And it's got this little, let me pull the cap off. It's got this little solar radiation sensor. And, and I don't know if you can see the balance on it but you can balance it to where it's at the, the same angle as the solar array. And we get two of these for each solar array because a lot of the solar arrays these days are double-sided. So you, apparently you can get some albedo from the bouncing of the solar array or solar radiation onto the bottom of the solar array, which is why they try to keep the vegetation clean uh, on the bottom of it. It, it really does affect uh, the effectiveness of it. And then the, the CO2 sensors, I mean, it, it's, a, it's important for both the regenerative agriculture and for the solar array monitoring. The, um, we, we would like to get a fire detection sensor. We're, we're uh, talking to a company that's got a fire detection sensor, but for right now, we've got a, a CO2 sensor from um, uh, Sen uh, SenseCap that will just look at CO2. Um, the fire sensors are nice, uh, because a lot of the solar arrays and the wind turbine locations in some states and some countries require you to have fire detection because that's going to be, those places are far enough away from cities that they will probably be the first, some of the first locations to actually get detection of, of ash and of particulates and of, of a bunch of other things. So I think I've talked about most of these. So we, uh, again, with our, with our workflows and our rules engine, we kind of look at, at the world as assets in motion and assets at rest. Um, and, and sometimes the two are, are interchangeable, but we're, our cold chain app is how we got into this. This is where we're monitoring uh, COVID test kits or anything else that requires temperature monitoring as it's moving through the supply chain. Um, recycling chain is working with that same partner, Everpoint, services that does vegetation management and and providing them with a with a proof of recycling so if if they get a big wind turbine blade and uh, they've got to prove that it didn't go into a landfill but it got chopped up and it got ground up and then it got melted down in a kiln and it got reused for you know some kind of replacement fuel we'll track that all the way through the process uh, using some IOT sensors like an Oyster or an Abbey Way to show that it got all the way there. And then we'll have some particulate sensors around it to make sure that they followed EPA guidelines when they were doing the grinding and when they were, they were doing the sawing that, that they didn't just spray all the fiberglass into the, into the air. 
Um, Cannabis Chain, we're working with a partner in Oklahoma City named Nature's Key, um, who has a very, very high quality medical cannabis. Uh, they, they test it uh, more than any other shop that I've seen because they, they're truly using it as, as medical cannabis, not as something else. So they've got people um, who have lupus and, and have pain from cancer and a variety of other things that are using their products. So they want us to track from uh, the, the distillate that they have to the lab and get the lab samples back uh, from samples of their product to the lab and get the lab results back and then track the product all the way from their manufacturing to the dispenser and then to the patient so that you can show that it's it truly is um, the product that they thought they were going to buy is what they have in their hands. And then I, I'm pretty sure I talked about the, the ones on the left hand side. Ashley's been doing a great job in the chat, kind of um, replying to some questions in there, but I know I had a few just um, kind of general questions, but can you talk a little bit about what kind of drew you to use Helium and to explore the Helium network at the beginning? Sure. So uh, we've, th these, um, the, the healthcare devices that we're used to, uh, like this blood glucose meter, and like this uh, body trace blood pressure cuff, you know, we've been using for a long, long time. Uh, and some of them have a, a cost model that, that takes that 3G network cost and builds it into the initial capital price. And that's great. So a customer only has to pay one time and they get the device and they can monitor their healthcare. Others don't. And they, they add on that monthly fee for the 3, 3G network. So we were already familiar with the, the problem of, you know, how do you get data from a device without killing yourself on the, on the monthly expense cost? Yeah. So when we went and started monitoring those, uh, those cold storage labs where the COVID-19 test kits were at, and we did the math on 10 bucks a month uh, for, per device, uh, it was, it was, it, it just wasn't going to work. So we, We've been following the Helium network for a while, just because of our, you know, our PKI background, and it just seemed like a natural fit. Awesome, that's great to hear. Um, kind of following up on what I was talking about with things that are coming in 2022 or things that we're working on. Are there specific things that you guys at Media Sorcery are um, especially excited about with Helium? Things you're, you know, really looking forward to in 2022 and beyond? Yeah, the new the new data only hotspots are are going to be a life saver for us. I mean, uh, I, we were having a conversation with Nick about how much data has to go back and forth with the current hotspots in, in an off-grid environment. And a lot of them, you have to update the entire blockchain, right? Uh, with the next HIP, I think that all moves to the validators. And then if you just have the data only hotspots, so if, if I have to go to a farm and I need to go use you know, HughesNet satellite network or my buddy Elon Starlink or um, Iridium, you know, if I can only send the data, that's going to make the ROI better for for these farmers that we're building this network for. So we're we're not going to wait. I mean, we we can't afford to wait. So we're going to go put some uh, hotspots out there. And and Jacob, we're going to try to do the calculation. One of the things we want to present at the United Nations is is can we, uh, you know, it, can we incentivize the farmers to do regenerative agriculture? by providing them a way to provide proof of coverage and proof of data on the Helium network and, and potentially taking that data and either um, selling it or, or motivating them to share best practices by, by, by using some of the tokens that we're gonna gain from, from providing that proof of coverage. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's super interesting. I like to hear that. Um, how about with media sorcery itself, you know, with the company, are there specific like verticals kind of tech um, things that you guys are looking to do in 2022 um, as well, like expanding a little bit that you can talk about? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the regenerative agriculture piece has taken off more than we anticipated. So I, I think that's going to be large. And, and I, I think it's going to follow the same path that a lot of our healthcare work did. You know, we, we can build all this cool technology, but ultimately you need somebody that actually is a subject matter expert to look at all this data and make a decision. You know, we really want to provide a way to uh, 
enable our customers to get carbon credits. So we want to collect, one of the reasons we're collecting all of this data is nobody, nobody knows right now. Let me, let me rephrase that. There are several opinions as to how much carbon credit you should get for regenerative farming, right? So you're, if you're doing it right and the carbon stays in the ground, that's great. How can we collect the right data so that a, a farmer who's doing regenerative or agricultural practices can trade that data and get a carbon credit? And that's the same for the recycling pieces. I mean, there should be carbon credits available for um, recycling wind turbines, wind turbine blades. Um, so I, I think that's that's going to be a large large part of what we do. There's a lot of carbon credit um, exchanges out there. They're all programmable. So all of our workflow engines that we have that just treat that as another task. If we can say, okay, we've got proof of carbon sequestration. I just want to go do a web services call, pop that carbon credit uh, up there um, and get that back for the farmer. Yeah. No, very interesting. Excited to see what you guys do. Um, you know, I know you've shown a lot of sensors. You said you have a room full of sensors around you right now you could geek out about. Um, are there specific sensors like that you've seen the most traction with or that you're really seeing a lot of popularity, you know, around certain sensors or certain applications using those sensors? Anything like that you can talk about? Yeah, I, I mean, the temperature sensors are pretty ubiquitous. I mean, everybody's got indoor and outdoor temperature sensors. Um, the air quality and the CO2 sensors I'm starting to see a lot more of and a lot more interest in. Um, I think there's, there's a big market for the soil sensors. I'm, I think I've, uh, all of the partners that we've talked to, uh, Dragino, uh, Descent Labs, um, have some kind of a, either a so combined soil moisture, electrical conductivity and temperature sensor uh, and a pH sensor. Um, what I really want, and Dragino had one, but they recalled it, uh, which is a good move on their part because they said it wasn't working right, is what's called a nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus sensor, an NPK sensor, which because that's really, really large in uh, regenerative agriculture measurements. So, I mean, it, it would be really nice, and I don't know if it's technically possible, to build one sensor that had all, all of those in it, you know, the soil moisture, the EC, the pH and the NPK, but I, I just don't know. I mean, this is, okay, more showing to, this is the uh, soil moisture, EC and um, temperature sensor, and it's a three pronger. And the pH sensor I left in the ground because we're doing some uh, work with it, but it's it's a two pronger. And one of them is a real thick prong that's, uh, it, it measures uh, something. I, I don't know if it measures across the the prong or what it does but it, it i don't know that it would be it would fit i mean you'd have to have a a dongle about this wide to get everything on it to be able to put it into the ground so it it, it may just be that you got to have multiple multiple different sensor types for that gotcha thanks thanks for being a straight man and let me show geek toys again <laughs> I, know, I know you've been wanting to do that i know i see your eyes going to those sensors <laughs> all the time yeah um Larry, this has been awesome. I'm going to share just um, my contact stuff here. I know it says Q&A. We've been doing Q&A. Um, but if anyone would like to get in contact with me or talk about more helium things, you can find us on GitHub, Twitter, Discord. I, Discord is one of the best places to go. Honestly, I think we're over 150,000 members in our Discord now. A lot of great resources, a lot of really smart people in there to answer questions. Um, bounce ideas off of it, everybody, things like that. You can also email me at jacob at helium.com. Mark Phillips is our vice president of BD. Um, he's just mark at helium.com there. Um, let me see. I see some things in the chat. Oh, okay. Um, Larry, is there anything, last words you want to say? Any contact stuff? Um, I know you had your slide up. I took it away, but this video will go up on our YouTube channel in the next 24 or 48 hours. So if people want to contact you, they can just go to YouTube here if they didn't write any of those links down and find that contact stuff too. But um, yeah, any last words from you? Uh, uh, there's a lot on our website. I want to shout out to McKenna, the article that she wrote about what we do uh, and is up on the Helium blog is a, is a really, really good um, summary of all of the different solutions, some of which we didn't get to in this, uh, in this podcast. So thank you, McKenna. That was an amazing article.
Yes, she's our she's our resident storyteller and she's a, she's great at it. OK, well, yep, Ashley, thank you for putting that in the chat. And thank you, everyone. Like I said, this will be up on our YouTube channel if you would like to rewatch or get some more contact info or anything like that. Otherwise, Larry, thank you so much for being on today. I appreciate it. It was great talking with you. I hope you get all your sensors cleaned up in <laughs> time. Thanks, Jacob. Thanks for yeah. having me. Man. It was good. Absolutely. Talking to you. Yep. Bye, everyone.